The draw of a video game series like The Witcher is pretty easy to parse out. While I definitely wouldn't say that the combat is bad, it just isn't the primary focus. For me, these RPGs have always been story driven, emphasizing characters, setting, and themes much more than almost any element, and not really bothering to pretend otherwise. If you're playing a Witcher game, you know exactly what you're going to get, and you'll likely still find yourself shocked at how effective it is, but that's besides the point. In this regard, Witcher 3's story expansions are everything that they needed to be to accentuate the strengths of the series. What I found interesting is that the two DLCs contrast and balance each other out in terms of narrative approach, which was effective in not allowing the series to get stale. We'll talk about Blood and Wine's approach to world building and integrative storytelling at a later date, but for now, I'll be discussing what I believe to be the superior character piece, Hearts of Stone. Hearts of Stone is an expansion that knows what the appeal of the series is, and broadens its horizons while still maintaining the dark, character-based, and story-focused nature that people are playing it for in the first place. While I've done my best to make this video series with the setting as the core topic, it's interesting because while this story does expand on the northeastern region of the world map in the Oxenford area, otherwise known as the Gustfields region, there is no entirely new setting like a Skellige or a Toussaint. So instead of Hearts of Stone leaning on setting and exploration based storytelling, it places the majority of its emphasis on crafting a powerful story through introducing or reintroducing some brilliant characters and themes. However, the setting has always been and remains to be a vital part of the Witcher experience, and this remains the case here. Most of this expansion takes place in Gustfields, which is a region to the northeast of the accessible mainland and one that includes Oxenford and its surrounding areas. Now, Oxenford itself is probably one of the most pleasant places to be in the game. Despite being clearly pro redanian there are no agendas being pushed by Radovid or the Church of the Internal Fire, simply because the city is already under their rule and in opposition to Nilfgaard. There are no mob bosses fighting over money or territory, no non-humans being burnt at the stake, and due to Oxenfur's occupation as a strictly aristocratic and high-class land, there aren't many poor townsfolk or top-heavy sociological imbalances, at least relative to Novigrad. As such, there isn't much tension in the streets, and a journey through Oxenford, obligatory random rude NPCs and drunken vampires notwithstanding, promises to be an enjoyable one. The architecture and views are stunning, the port is romantic, and the world-renowned Oxenford Academy's mere presence lends an alluring mystique to the area. Of course, it isn't the perfect place to be. It may just be me, but I actually become put off by Oxenford if I stay there too long. As I said, although there are beggars here and there, the vast majority of Oxenford is full of well-off people, ranging from middle-class boat workers to the richest of rich nobles and the attitudes of these people reflect a society that has had to become used to mingling with high class. We'll see this much more in Toussaint, but it is present in Oxenford as well. You come across nobles who speak in such a clearly deliberate and postured way, and it just isn't organic or welcoming for the most part. Everywhere you go, there are Redanian guards praising Radovid and citizens proclaiming their love for the eternal fire. And although they usually aren't trying to force any opinions, it does become tiring, especially when the player is unlikely to share these sentiments. The combination of this artificial posturing, the pompous academy students, and one specific Oxenford song, which is beautiful but filled with achingly high notes that tend to get grating after being looped a bunch of times, it all made Oxenford sickly sweet to the point where I could never spend too long in it without wanting to leave to do something else like trying to eat a chocolate cake that's too rich and too sweet for me to finish. Now, I am overstating this to get my point across, but essentially what I'm trying to say is that for me, despite it being one of the most pleasant cities in the game, the lack of a down-to-earth attitude in Oxenfurt prevented it from being as welcoming as a place like Ard Skellig. Maybe this is just me though, so be sure to let me know in the comments. Importantly, some of the low-key bars within Oxenford are much appreciated because of this, adding some welcome levity and a break from the thick aristocracy. Just to clarify, this is not a complaint at all. I think it's marvelous integrative setting design. And assuming I'm not the only one who felt something like this, I also think that CD Projekt Red did this intentionally due to our protagonist. Geralt is far from a man who would be comfortable in a city with so many aristocrats for too long, so it makes sense that the player in his shoes wouldn't consider Oxenford homely either. When we move north and slightly east from Oxenford, we get into Gustfields proper. 
For the most part, this area is relatively economically healthy, especially in comparison to the state of Velen and Novigrad. It's not a densely populated region, with little settlements littered here and there, but it is stable. It's home to notable manors like the Vagelbud Estate and the Honeyfill Meadworks, which attract all sorts of posh crowds. And even the poorest homes in this area are better off than the vast majority of Velen and the slums of Novigrad. Jobs are plentiful, there is very little disease, and while it should be noted that this is still a region with its own monster problems within a setting that is largely terrible, things are still relatively prosperous here. Gustfield is in a healthier position, both geographically and economically, than arguably any mainland area in the game other than Toussaint. And this in itself opens the land up to a different kind of atmosphere compared to the boggy misery of Velen and the dirty corruption of Novigrad. Families get by here, so there is no inherent bleakness that can be felt just by listening to dialogue or paying attention to visual cues. Instead, the land is dripping with a traditional creepiness factor, calling back to classic horror tales. And this is established both through the topography and the little immersion touches that the game adds in. With very little swamp land in sight, Gusfields contains lush trees, wide expanses of land, farms, open roads, and fields, and this lends itself to a more traditional type of horror. There is just an inherent eeriness in hearing children in a clearing sing Gaunter Odim's song, or in the imagery of a woman in white standing alone in the distance, accentuated by the flatlands and illuminated in the moonlight. Cornfields evoke the classic tales of pagan gods and possessed scarecrows and the backdrop to the crossroads deal in the village of Yantra is ironically creepy, where sunflowers, the symbol of longevity and the sun, are juxtaposed with the presence of a man associated instead with death and the moon. These elements are all classic horror story tropes, but they're all elements of Gusfields that work beautifully in driving home the atmosphere without being starkly different from the tone of the main game. While there is still that classic Witcher feeling of evil lurking beneath the surface, as explored through the pair of cannibals that we meet for example, the economics, sociology, and geography of Gusfields are big contributors to the much different, more referential story feel of Hearts of Stone. The Witcher games have always referenced ancient stories and fairy tales through some of their monsters, but they have always felt organic and natural within the setting. The Neckers literally emerge from the muck and return there when disposed of. Ghouls scour the grounds for food. Leshens are as much of a part of the forests in which they reside as the trees. The Crones have been associated with Velen for as long as anyone in the setting can remember. As a result of this, the Witcher series, and especially Witcher 3, carries an atmosphere that feels like as much of a part of the setting as it is a result of the setting. There are supernatural elements, of course, but these elements feel so distinctly natural due to the lore and land, and are very much aided by organic sound design to complement the immersive visuals. But the tone in Hearts of Stone is different, while still being very Witcher-esque to avoid tonal whiplash. Near the beginning, this uniqueness is established through the introduction of the Ophiri, a race of people much different from anyone we've met so far. This jerks the audience out of what they believe to be the natural order of the setting, and prepares them for the crux of Hearts of Stone, Gaunter Odim. I'll talk about him a little bit more later on, but he is essential to the tone of this story. This man is so clearly wrong and extraordinary, and he operates in such unknowns that he is the main reason that the tone is so different in this DLC, and why Gustfields as a region has such a different feel. I did mention that the topography is a huge contributor in this sense, and it is but it wouldn't be without Gaunter. And this is what allows the tone to change. While the tone of Velen and Skellige were pretty consistent, Hearts of Stone follows Novigrad's tonal framework in that it swings from the lighthearted to the horrific. Yet on the horrific side of things, it forsakes Novigrad's grounded violence for tragedy and disturbing folk tales. And it does this with the feel of a traditional horror tale, one where the weird and mystical suddenly feel new again. It's a stylistic shift that allows the newly supernatural to feel especially supernatural in a setting that's enriched in the supernatural. There was an almost a whimsical nature in the story's lightest moments. The wedding party, the dancing, the classy auctions, diving for a shoe, etc. But when things shifted, they got somber and depressing as hell. Yet it wasn't a byproduct of the setting. It was exaggerated by the setting, but it was entirely on the characters. And it all centered around Master Mirror, an unfamiliar and alien man. Due to this, Hearts of Stone somehow makes a world that always seemed natural seem unnatural. There are no huge changes in the environment, and most of these areas are places you've been able to go before, 
but mixing the slight alterations of gust fields with the new context of a strange and foreign quest set by an eerie man changes everything. If we take a step back from Hearts of Stone for a second, I think it's pertinent to point out that this game features a myriad of personalities who all leave a lasting impact, yet the story never feels bloated due to some very effective contrasts in approaching these personalities. In my opinion, The Witcher 3 tackles its character presentation in one of two ways. Low impact high volume, and high impact low volume. Obviously, this isn't a straight dichotomy and the characters are dynamic and fluid, but I do believe there to be a general pattern. And note here that I'm not talking about characterization or who these characters really are as human beings, but rather the impact that they had on the story. The first method, low impact, high volume, is a slow and gradual introduction. These characters are presented early to mid game and remain important characters for the entire length, appearing consistently throughout the story. These characters generally tend to be introduced in a mundane or relatively low stakes fashion, like a low key tavern brawl or a fairly non dramatic situation, though there are notable exceptions. Oftentimes, these introductions give a pretty decent snapshot of what said character is like, but refrain from telling the player everything about them in order to have them fleshed out over time through the main story or side quests. In some cases, this initial snapshot is fairly accurate, but lacking in nuance that is provided later on. These characters also tend to be prominent ones from the novels or past games, which lessens the need for a huge amount of characterization right off the bat. For me, examples of this first type of character presentation would be Triss, Vesemir, Zoltan, Emir, Dandelion, Roche, or Ciri. We're given a very distinct personality for these people, but at the same time it isn't forced upon us too harshly and we're given license to slowly become invested in them. The second type is much more robust. These characters are given less screen time than the first type, but are intended to be just as impactful as those who feature more. As such, in comparison, their story segments tend to be highly dramatic, emotional, or strange from the start, and within a few minutes, the story more or less slaps you in the face with who they are, or at least, who they present themselves to be. While this initial impression may not tell the whole story of said character, what is true is that it is very bold. At times, these characters end up deceiving what their first impression portrayed, which feeds into another element of them. That the story beats for these characters tend to be filled with twists and turns, and unfamiliar situations, which is useful for making them memorable and distinct to compensate for a lack of exposure to them. Examples of these characters would be the Bloody Baron, the Crones of Crookback Bog, Skial, and Dijkstra. Now obviously this isn't a strict rule, and there are characters that don't follow it, but I do think that there is an obvious approach contrast here. And what's beautiful about these contrasts is that neither is better than the other, at least not in my opinion. By the end of my experience with the main game's story, I had roughly the same amount of interest in someone like Dandelion as I did with the Bloody Baron, even though the two were presented in such different ways. Now if we come back to the expansion, I believe that CD Projekt Red intentionally tackled the characters within Hearts of Stone using the second method, High Impact, Low Volume. And this makes sense given that this is a relatively short, remarkable story. Shawnee's introduction quickly and efficiently establishes exactly who she is to anyone unfamiliar, displaying both her intelligence and compassion in a situation where she is genuinely mourning and filled with anxiety. Later on, the wedding side quest is also very bold, and it's endearing to see Shawnee's attempts to get Geralt to have some fun and let loose in an environment that is so mundane that it's bizarre. Within that very same environment, we can see that Vladimir von Everick stands apart. The juxtaposition between his carefree, hedonistic nature and the pretty damn evil things he did in his life really made him someone unlike anyone else in the game. Through his interactions, we're shown this time and time again. He's almost a polar opposite to Geralt in terms of personality, and acts as a really cool foil to bring some things to light about Geralt's character that we as players sometimes tend to forget. But by the end, we find that beneath everything, he's insecure and aware to his deficiencies as a person. I found myself simultaneously hating the guy for his past actions, and kind of liking him and wanting him to enjoy his final hours in this world, so Odin's treatment of him was ironically kind of disturbing. And finding out that the myth and legend of Vladimir's death was a load of hot air fueled by Olgird's guilt at sacrificing his brother was a bitter pill to swallow. As such, Vladimir is hard hitting until the end, and definitely one of the most memorable elements of Hearts of Stone.
Because we're introduced to the fact that something has gone very wrong with her beforehand, there is a weight to everything that Iris von Everick does when we're introduced to her. Not only is the memory-based, sequential painting world really useful in association with her to make her stand out, but everything about her story is so goddamn tragic. There isn't any grand or analytical explanation to why she's effective in my opinion. She's just a sweetheart, and a romantic, who slowly became a hollow shell due to her suffering and misery. And it works in the story. However, to me, Iris is as much a character of her own as she is a tool for revealing exactly who Olgierd was. Olgierd von Everick, for all of his detachment, felt to me like the big emotional core of this story. And while it may seem a bit stupid to talk about a man with a literal heart of stone like that, there is a bit of meaning behind my madness. I think that this unemotional man is the emotional core of Hearts of Stone because he so clearly embodies everything that makes life worthwhile through displaying what a lack of these worthwhile things can lead to. And this, in turn, makes Hearts of Stone a very poignant work. To sum up Olgierd, he was a man that was in love with a woman whom he eventually got engaged to. However, he basically went bankrupt, which caused his fiancé's family to disapprove of the marriage. In order to keep all that he held dear, he impulsively made a deal with a strange man where he wished to not only have his wealth back, but to, and I quote, live like there is no tomorrow. After sacrificing Olgierd's brother as payment, the strange man carried out the requests quite literally, and in order to carry out the live like no tomorrow wish, Olgierd was turned immortal. While he was given back what he had lost, his immortality had a cost, and he slowly but surely sank into apathy as his heart turned to stone. He became a shell of a man, unfeeling and broken. He had a home and he had his beloved, but his slow descent meant that their relationship did not stand the test of time. There are some little moments in the scenes from a marriage quest that sum up the sad situation brilliantly. The moment where Iris prompts Olgierd to smile for her painting and he literally can't bring himself to do so. Or the way the extra chairs from the long table were tucked away in a dusty dark corner, clearly displaying that this manor had become a desolate and sad place. The caretaker was terrifying yet tragic with everything he represented, and the dog and cat tried, but did little to help in this regard. It was all down to Olgierd. At the beginning of the story, he looks at a nude statue that the average person would find beautiful or erotic, and he sees nothing but boring curves. He can't feel, meaning he can't love, meaning that the exchange he made with Odim was ultimately meaningless and actually debilitating. Then Von Everick ceased to be human. Though he still loved his wife. No, he merely remembered that he should love her. Before, I wished to know what was going on in that head of yours. I thought perhaps I could help. Now, I care not the slightest what you think or how you feel. I... feel nothing. It begs the question, is Olgierd really even living anymore? He felt obligated to care for Iris and their situation and life in general, but he just couldn't. And as much as it pained him, it didn't pain him at all. And that was the true heartfelt irony of Olgierd. However, if Olgierd forms the emotional core of Hearts of Stone through his unemotionality, then Gaunter Odim is the coldness in the narrative. While I truly believe that there is no clear-cut quote-unquote bad guy in Blood and Wine, I cannot say the same about Hearts of Stone. It has a bad guy. It's this guy. While this may not be completely clear until the end, and while the story does play around with grey morality, for the majority of players, Odim is the villain. Gontaro Dim is an enigma. While there is plenty of symbolism that lends itself to the idea that he is the literal devil, these are all references and allusions and nothing is conclusive. We don't really know who he is exactly, and I think that was the point, because this unknown factor plays into his mystique. There are some interesting parallels between him and Mephistopheles, a character in a classic Polish poem and play, but I'm going to refrain from getting into that and instead link a video that explains it better than I could in the description. Aside from this, I've heard some say that he's God, that he's a simple crossroads demon with insane power, that he's a reflection of the setting or mankind, a simple mirror salesman who can make extraordinary contracts, you name it. It is demonstrated more than once throughout the game that he is mean-spirited though. He genuinely enjoys putting others through misery, and he kills at the tip of a hat. 
He also malevolently plays with semantics and twists words when forming contracts, so he is far from a neutral enabler that simply makes deals. But I think what is important is that he seems to be limited by his contracts. He is not completely overpowered. He does have rules and he does abide by them. And whether this preoccupation with rules is something that he is magically bound to adhere to, or a simple code of honor is up for debate. But given what we do know about him, I'd bank on it being the former. If something like this were to be the case, then it seems as though our Master Mirror is part of some sort of greater plan, and related at least in part to establishing order. He's evil for sure, but he just might be tasked with something. Something else that I found interesting about him is that he seems to be an advocate of spontaneity and human instinct. He greatly enjoys the wedding, he seems to have fun talking cookies, and most notably, he tried to coerce Geralt into giving in to a night of passion with Shawnee. Rather manage without your advice, thank you. She cares for you. You have feelings for her. Don't overthink it. Surrender to spontaneous honesty. Nothing more beautiful than human relationships. Whether or not this is just a mask he puts on is not clear, but outwardly, he very much seems to value mankind's primitive needs or urges. However, while this may seem a bit odd and unfitting at first, this makes much more sense when you remember the exact way he gets people to agree to his deals, through appealing to them via temptation. It seems that he endorses this sort of thing in general, and this is also demonstrated in the final riddle of the game, where the Souls-esque hellscape is littered with temptations to distract Geralt from solving the puzzle. It's clear to me that Odim represents the downsides of excessive temptation and primitive instinct, and perhaps this harkens back to the idea of him being a tool for order. Perhaps his job is to weed out the irrational and unworthy of the world by getting them to give in to reckless temptation and causing them to succumb to misery. And maybe defeating him in the end, at least temporarily, is indicative of and advocates genuine human spirit, not only through the freedom it brings about, but for what it means symbolically. Maybe his tricks reflect the depravity of man, or maybe he's just having fun with some godly powers that were gifted to him. I don't really know. The closest I can think of to a theory for Gaunter is that he represents mankind's tendency to be the making of its own destruction. He uses people's own words against them, twisting their words to cause suffering and misery like a warped mirror. It's unfair and not intentional by those who make deals with him, but this tainted filter that he acts as greatly represents the real world. Sometimes life isn't fair. However, despite this being a decent enough description of what Odim represents, it's still uncertain regarding just what he is. I'm not sure what to believe with Gaunter, and to be completely honest, I hope I remain in the dark. There's a certain aura that is added to the man that comes with not knowing who he really is, and in a world where Geralt knows everything about all manner of supernatural lore, there's a bit of beauty in remaining oblivious. Hearts of Stone is full of cliches. A prince turned into a frog, a classic crossroads dealing with a demon of sorts, Odim himself. This expansion is full of fairy tale cliches, thematic cliches, storytelling cliches, the lot of it. Now, the word cliché understandably has a negative connotation attached to it, but that's only because clichés integrated with feeble narratives or story points come off as lazy and dependent. But clichés themselves are perfectly fine if used with purpose. While the main game proper was a bit more subtle with its homages and more dependent on original inspiration, this expansion focuses on commonly used tropes or ideas, but puts all of its effort into making it feel consistent with the setting naturally weaving it in with the world and giving it substance through powerful themes and well-defined characters. With the use of personified reflections, this story plays around with the idea of either nature or circumstance shaping people, almost using these people as literary foils of one another. Horst and Uwald of the Heist Mission are a demonstration of two people with similar circumstances who went about life in such different ways, although I personally thought both were pretty awful people. Vladimir provides a reflection and contrast of Geralt, especially while possessing him, that demonstrates how different our beloved protagonist would be if perhaps he wasn't exposed to such trying circumstances, or maybe if he was just more carefree at heart. I interpreted Iris as a tragic reflection of Shawnee, being a woman who was literally taken prisoner by love compared to one who was determined to pursue personal fulfillment instead of a love that would shackle her. As I said earlier, Odim could be construed as a reflection of humanity's malice as well. 
Now, I'm not saying that these are the only examples, nor are they the best ones, but the mirror concept really helps to draw our characters into sharp relief when applied to characterization. It's very on the nose, but there really isn't too much wrong with that. Hearts of Stone seems to follow the framework of a classic Faustian tale applied to a deal with the devil, but it's actually based on the Polish story of Pan Twardowski. I'm not going to pretend to be someone who's overly familiar with Twardowski, so again I'll be linking that video in the description for anyone who wants a more comprehensive overview of Hearts of Stone's relation to it. But the key here is that in both Faustian tales and Twardowski, a deal is struck with a superior entity wherein the ramifications of said deal end up being or threaten to be worse than the benefits of the deal. The two stories have overlap and were perhaps even influenced by one another, but what's important thematically is that they're rooted in this theme of an unfair exchange, an everlasting life in exchange for all that makes life worth living. The concept that despite how dark things may seem in the moment, no such deal is worth it. Because in these cases, the pattern tends to be that only when you realize what you've lost in life do you come to truly value it. It's a paradox of sorts, explored through Olgir's tragic story, that allows the audience to truly grasp how beautiful the little quirks in life are and how we tend to take them for granted. It's the be careful what you wish for idea. And while this theme does tend to saturate modern media, it is consistent with Hearts of Stone's nature of familiar ideas used in a fresh and powerful way, and it is a theme that has its fingerprints over nearly everything in the narrative. There is perhaps no greater place to start here than with the title itself. Hearts of Stone is a pretty self-explanatory title. It speaks of closing oneself off to enjoyment in life, and within the title and the story itself, the key is that this closed offness is spoken of regardless of intention or context, because it is explored throughout the game through many different contexts. It's this ever-poignant idea of taking life by the scruff of the neck and enjoying it. Truly living. If you get too narrow-minded or tunnel vision because of your goals and allow this to rule your life, then you're missing the forest for the trees. It's the tiny moments and beautiful little spontaneities that provide the happiest time in our lives, and turning a blind eye to this is such a sad and lonely thing. We can see the negatives of having a heart of stone through the slow deterioration of Olgird and Iris, Shani's frustration at Geralt's sense of duty, Gontaro Dim's almost literal, uncaring heart of stone which leads to so much suffering, and more. But consistent with the concept of reflections that is ever present in the story, we are also shown what happens when one opens themselves up, and how rewarding this can be. As clear as it is that it will just be a one-time thing if you romance Shawnee, this true night of passion ends up being a rewarding one for the both of them. As bad of a person as Vladimir was, it is genuinely endearing to see him find so much joy in such simple pleasures. As terrible as some of Olgird's actions were, it is genuinely sad to see a person that has been reduced to such a shell. It's even ironically reflected upon by Odim and his ability to take or destroy once beautiful lives at a whim. And in Vesemir's old fling, who solemnly mourns him and reflects on the lovely times she had with him in the past. Life is fleeting, so it's important to do what you can to make it worthwhile. The idea that Geralt should let loose once in a while is actually also demonstrated in the main game, as all of the times where he just allowed himself to have fun, such as when he's goofing around with Yen or having a snowball fight with Ciri, are the ones that he would likely look back on most fondly. Sure I didn't let you win? Sure you're not smarting from a defeat by a true maestro? <laughs> you were right. That really works. Thanks. Again, it's a theme that most of the audience will be familiar with, but it's also one that has timeless appeal and emotional resonance if it's presented in the correct way because of this familiarity. And it's emphasized one last time in the final story beat of the expansion. At the end of the path where you thwart Odim, we're left with such a beautiful contradiction. Olgird, human once again, left with virtually none of the joys of his previous life. He's miserable because of this, yet irrationally excited at the possibility of simply being able to feel again. The possibility of being human. Did Olgird really deserve this freedom? Well, that's a highly subjective question. A lot of his evil was his choice, but due to his unique circumstances, one could argue that it's hard to truly judge what he did after making the deal. Either way, the chances are that if you indeed played out this ending, then some part of you wanted to give the guy a second chance. We as consumers of fiction, 
tend to find vicarious fulfillment in seeing characters experience some form of freedom. So in this moment, it's easy to forget all of Olgier's horrible misdeeds and simply be a little happy for him. And the cinematography is absolutely stunning in communicating the loneliness that Olgier feels through his dark silhouette, yet at the same time, the sunset and vast expansion of land before him shows just how broad his possibilities are now that he has a new lease on life. There's a palpable rawness here, and all of Hearts of Stone's ideas seem to coalesce in this one final conversation. So what'll you do? I don't know. But one thing's clear. It's time I took fate into my own hands, lived life anew, and truly this time. Thanks for taking the time to watch this. I'm sorry that it took so long for part 4 to be released, but I'll do my best to make sure that part 5 doesn't take as long. Let me know what you thought of this expansion, its story, its characters, and your interpretation of them in the comments below, and have a good one.